everybody, welcome to an exciting, exciting broadcast that I have been, I've actually been counting the days. And uh, I know from experience, it always takes a little while before people are signing up. So before I introduce this young man here, <laughs> we want to start to see people are coming in. So before we start doing anything, let me know where you're watching from, uh, depending on, of course, Okay, we're back. We're yeah. back. We're gonna try to continue. We're gonna try to continue. I had a little bit of a glitch yesterday with the Wi-Fi, yeah, but we are sitting here. This. Yes, but I did one live video today to oh, just okay. tell people on my. Uh, let's try and see if this one is here. So again, Daniel Seaman, welcome. Thank you. Uh, still, just gonna wait and see a little bit. I have another one going on here uh, because this is where I would want to. See, here we are. I can't see anything. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see if people are going to start to sign up. Normally there would be people now, so we're going to see what's going on. If anybody is here, sign in, give me thumbs up, or uh, we'll find out, we're out if we're going to try and close this one down and try again. Um, people are signing in. Let's see a little bit. I have no idea how this works. I've never done it. Have you ever done a Facebook Live? No, no. Well, surprising for me. This is all so here come at least one. Here come, you can see it's up in the corner. Uh, I guess I'm not wearing my glasses. Ah, <laughs> but you can wear your glasses. I have, you can definitely wear your glasses. I found that the glasses are, I lose my concentration with glasses. Okay. So, let's see. Okay. Are they right on here as well? Or just... That's the thing, and I'm going to try. Okay. I have my iPad going down here. Right. So, we're just going to wait a little bit. Normally, people are. A little bit more um, awake. Yeah, <laughs> normally people are a little bit more awake. It's because we have some very, very important things to talk about today. Uh, I have received many questions about the political situation in Israel, okay. and I have been trying to make my own little small videos speaking about, about things. Okay. Yes, but uh, before I really give a big introduction, so everybody give us up. Uh, some thumbs up, let us know where you're watching from around the world. Do we have Europe? Do we have America? Do we have Brazil? Where are you watching from? We'll see. Okay. So Daniel Seaman, welcome to my little TV studio. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how things change over the years. You can do things that once you needed a whole operation and now you yeah. know a one person show. It's it's Not incredible. Yeah. All you need is a little phone. Right. So could you give me thumbs up if you can hear us, if you can see us, if the sound is okay, if you can hear what we are saying. Someone is uh, from Texas. From Texas, a great state of Texas. Wonderful. Shalom to <laughs> Texas. So Daniel, we'll, let's just dive into this. Um, I want to introduce you to this gentleman sitting next to me. Uh, Daniel Seaman, uh, we met, that was before even my press pass, so this must yes, have been, when, you just when did you do Israel. Lion's Den? Uh, oh, you're talking about the Lion's Den, I did that after I, I, I interviewed you when I yeah. left government, that yeah. was about uh, five years ago. Yeah, five yeah years. it's coming up, and yeah. I left government, uh, it'll be, oh wow, uh, it'll be seven years already. When we were young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been a while. Yeah, so um, Daniel interviewed me uh, about five, six years ago. That's where we met. He had a really, really interesting you radio met, program. I when you came to, to started working here when I was still with the government press office. I don't even remember. Yeah, that's that long ago. It was long ago. I was oh, in yeah. government press office almost uh, nine years yeah, ago. Yeah, I don't even yeah. remember. You came looking for a press card. I did. Yeah, yeah. I was so, turned down brutally. Yeah, no, uh, they, they made they made it difficult for you because your whole operation was uh, new. Yeah, you yeah. were ahead of your time. I, oh. <laughs> yes, you were. And they didn't know how to respond to yeah, right. all these kind of bloggers and, and people doing this that wasn't made, working for the mainstream media. Yeah. So you really But were times ahead. are changing, you know, absolutely, with a phone, absolutely. you reach the world. Right, right. So you were you were one of those who introduced us to this whole new wow. new thing. And uh, you did get your, you, the visa I and did. the press card and I'm everything. I'm so yeah. blessed. I'm <laughs> yes. so blessed. Wow, I didn't, wow. Yeah, it's that long Incredible. ago. Incredible. So we know each other that long. We do. <laughs> so Daniel, um, you all, I mean, I, 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 I was reading up about you. I, your resume, wow, this man is impressive. 
I mean, you have worked, you were the spokesperson for six prime ministers. Yes. Six. Six different prime ministers. I worked in government for 30 years, since 1983. I started working in the consulate in New York. Wow. And then I came back to Israel and uh, after finishing my degree in uh, political science in the States, wow. I came back and started working in uh, 1989 with the government press office. And at that time it was Itzhak Shamir. And I worked with Shamir and I worked with Rabin and I, I, I left the government under uh, uh, Rabin because of Oslo. I just didn't feel okay. that I could represent it. No. And I worked with the idea of spokesman union. You did? Yes, for, you for two years. And then I came back uh, under Netanyahu. I worked with Netanyahu, Barack, Sharon, Olmert, and Netanyahu again. <laughs> That's, I, you know a lot of things. <laughs> you have seen a lot of things. I've seen a lot. I don't know if I know a lot, I've seen a lot. You've seen a lot. Yes. So you are definitely the right person to be here today. <laughs> Probably. Uh, absolutely incredible. So I invited this gentleman because, uh, like I said before, we are living in interesting times. Always. In Israel, oh, it's always. In, in Israel, it's yes. always very, very interesting. But the thing is, um, you know, the entire time I've been living here, there's only been one prime minister, yeah. Benjamin Netanyahu. Right. It's been the same. I have two. I have four children. Two of them only know one prime minister. They, <laughs> it's like me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is very interesting. Um, but things are changing, mm -hmm. and uh, people are asking me when they follow me on my social media, saying, "Jane, what?" In, what is going on in Israel? We love Israel. We pray for Israel. You know, we love to come to Israel. It's our favorite country. We don't really understand. Then you have one election. Then you have two elections. And what in the world is going on? Now you are, you know, in the midst of a third election. Right. And I have been trying to explain in my little capacity. But I thought, like, who can I ask who can really... So that's why you are here. <laughs> who are you going to ask? <laughs> Yeah, I'm here but, to answer um, that question. Yes, but listen, Daniel, could you just explain a little bit yeah. about the Israeli parliament? How is it built up? Mm -hmm. what, who's in there now? How do you make a coalition? Just like the basic. Well, for those in the United States, Europeans probably understand this a little more because we have a parliamentary system. In the okay. parliamentary system, it's uh, you, unless you have a full majority, uh, you have to work on coalitions. So if yeah. you can form a coalition, you can then, the, the person who formed that coalition can become the prime minister. Uh, we have scheduled elections every four years, but if there is a vote of non -conf no confidence, like we had, which happened exactly a year ago, yeah. uh, there was a vote of no confidence, but actually before the no vote of no confidence, the government decided uh, to, uh, to go to early elections, which yes. in this case was going to be six months before. This was the longest, it's ironic, we had the longest government in the history of the state of Israel, which lasted for a little over, for almost four years. Wow. Um, and what we have now is a very unusual situation yes. of having, first off, we went to second elections for the first time in the history of Israel. And just to make the point, they're now going to the third elections. And this is because no individual has been able to form a government. Now, in the United States, this is different. When you're elected and you get enough uh, electoral vote, uh, uh, votes, you're president for four years. And yeah. there's no way that you can uh, topple that president. Yeah. In parliamentary elections, it can happen. You can go to early elections, you can uh, uh, decide, have a decision on calling on elect early elections, is like we had. So this is the situation we reach, and this is where we are. In the, in the government of Israel, you need 61 seats. We have 120 members of our parliament. Wow. Um, it's, it's not regional. It's not like, uh, you know, it's more like, it's like Congress and, and the Senate but in this case, they don't represent a region, they represent a party. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a party electoral system where anybody who gets over, um, I believe, 3% of the, of the voting, it, it's not 3% of the population, 3% of those who actually voted. If you get 3%, you have 3% um, or 5%, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of low. I think it's 3%, uh, you get three seats in the, okay. if you don't reach the 3%, you don't You're have out. any seats. You're yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. So then the person that the president, this is what happened here, usually is the person who has the largest number. If you got 30 seats and that's more than anybody else, if you had, uh, in this case, we had two parties a yeah. year ago who had 35 seats, I believe. We have to, you know, it's amazing, we have to remember three, uh, less yeah, than a year ago, so many things have happened. Yeah. But in this case, we've had, in the past few years, not necessarily the person with the, with the largest number of seats, but the person who could form of the, the coalition. Yeah. And uh, this was given back in the elections in April. It was assigned to Netanyahu. 
And if you think about it at that time, it seemed that he had the majority because yeah. the one person who surprised everybody was Lieberman. Um, I was going to mention that. <laughs> yes. So Lieberman ran on a ticket. He used to be a member of Likud. Yeah. He separated and created his own party representing the interests of the Russian minority in Israel, the former members of the Soviet Union, former people from the uh, Jews from the Russian, uh, uh, from the um, uh, former Soviet Union. And many of them, and, and the people who voted for him are usually more to the right. And they expected him to join. So that's yeah. when the president also, and, and the president only gives the person who other members of Knesset yeah. say he has the best chance. Yeah. So everybody expected Lieberman since he had uh, uh, supported Netanyahu and uh, recommended to the president, our president, that uh, Netanyahu can form the government. They expected it to be very easy. Instead, Lieberman refused to join yes. Lieber, uh, uh, Netanyahu's government. At that point, he was saying he didn't want to have, because we have religious parties here, he didn't want, uh, he said that they were extorting the prime minister and he was giving them too much, so he refused to join that coalition. Yeah. So at that time, they decided to disperse the government again, or the Knesset again, we didn't have a government, and they went to second elections, and that was back in September. Yes. And from, from September until last week, Netanyahu was given the opportunity, Gantz was given the opportunity, and then for the first time in the history of Israel, it was given to any member of Knesset yes. who could come to the, prime, to the president and say, we have, I can form a government. Nobody did that, and though the Knesset again dispersed itself, and now we're heading on to the 2nd of March for a third election, uh, hoping that maybe the results will be different this time and somebody can form uh, a, go a, a, a government. I don't like making predictions on the elections, but I can tell you one thing. If Netanyahu cannot form a government, or I'll say this differently, there will not be fourth election. That I, was a question. I can tell you there will not be a fourth election because if Netanyahu cannot form, he's now leading the Likud, and we expect after the elections next week within Likud have uh, elections for the leader of the party, which uh, I would be... It would be uh, really a huge surprise if Netanyahu was not elected within the Likud. So I'm, I'm saying that he will be the leader of Likud in these elections. But if he cannot form a government after the next elections, he will have to step down. And then somebody in the Likud, Likud will vote for somebody to replace him. And that person most likely will be able to. Now, if Netanyahu doesn't get a majority, then obviously he won't be able to form the government. But let's say he gets a, he gets a, a, a large majority or is very similar. If he cannot form a government, he will have to step down. Unfortunately, that will yeah. be the circumstances. We will not have a fourth election. Wow. So everybody watching this, can you please share this out? Because uh, there are a lot of people asking what's going on in Israel. And as you can hear, he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> I also want to I say, if you so. have any questions for Daniel regarding politics, regarding all the things that's going on here, you just uh, type in your question. And while he talk, I will watch. I also have my iPad going down here. So Daniel, um, just explain a little bit about the different parties because I okay. also know, you know, they make blogs. There's like a right wing blog. They right. signed, you know, they're just going to. So, so is it like in any other country? We kind of like have the left, we have the people in the middle and we have the people on the right. Is it like here? Well, you, you have the right wing and left wing, but yeah. basically in Israel, you would consider the right wing um, Likud, basically, which is a conservative party. Yeah. Uh, the new right, which was uh, Bennett and... Um, uh, Shaked. And Shaked, thank you. And then you have the former religious party, the National Religious Party, that I, to be honest, I don't even remember what they call themselves anymore because they keep changing it. This has happened so rapidly in the past year. But they were what used to be the National Religious Party. Yeah. Um, these, are, these are not ultra-Orthodox views. And then you have the two ultra-Orthodox parties, one, Shas, which is more uh, the Mizrahi, the, the, uh, from North Africa and Asian countries, mm -hmm. and then you have the Ashkenazi, which are from the former European countries, um, Jews who came from those countries who are more uh, Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox. Mm -hmm. uh, so those would be all considered um, from the right, but the religious parties don't really consider themselves right-wing, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, it's more easier for the conservative parties to form a, co a government with them. Um, you have Lieberman who considers himself right-wing but yes. refused to join the right-wing bloc and he is opposed to the religious, as he calls it, religious oppression. Then you have uh, uh, um, the Gantz party, which was uh, blue and white, which is not a party. It's actually a, um, a coalition 
of uh, former parties. Well, you, yeah, explain that. Please. One of them is Lapid's party, which was center left. The other is the new party, which was I don't even remember what he calls himself, Gans. Uh, um, so he had his party that he joined with members of Likud from the past, who joined with him. Um, Initially, they joined with him, was former Minister of Defense and the former uh, spokesman for the Prime Minister and the yeah. former direct, um, the former uh, cabinet secretary. These are all people who in the past had uh, run-ins with Netanyahu. Yeah, yeah. And they all created their own party and they joined with uh, that and Lapid joined them also. So they are all center left. Yes. And then you have the former Labour Party or the remnants of it, what's left of the historic Labour Party, which was Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir's party, Rabin's party, Shimon Peres' party. It's, it's very sad what has uh, remained of them. They've gone so far to the left that people have broken away from them. And then if they're so far to the left, you have even the extreme left, which is the citizens, former citizens' right party. Uh, and then you have the Arab parties, the Arab uh, wait, wait, parties wait, wait. in Israel. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Okay. People talk about apartheid. The, you know, the Arabs are second class citizens and yeah. they are not allowed to vote. Yes. Can, so we got Arab parties in Knesset? Of course, and not only Arab parties in Knesset, you have Arab members of uh, the other parties. In Likud, for example, the only party that holds primaries in Israel, many people can run. I actually voted for two members of Likud who are Muslim women, actually Muslim women, two wow. of them running for Likud. And uh, there's a Muslim guy and there's a Druze. The Likud has a Druze member. They're Druze members yeah. of other parties. They're Arab members of other parties. So they can run in any party, but they have their own lists that run. Some Arabs in Israel say that these Arab parties don't even represent the interests of them, and they're sort of disappointed, yeah. but they represent more Palestinian interests and not so much the Arab citizens of the state of Israel. So we have to make this clear. There are 20% of the Israeli population, 20 to 24% are non-Jewish, 20% at least are Arab, and uh, they've always been able to run and serve. Um, and they, they're on the different uh, Knesset committees. Uh, we've had Arab members of uh, Arab members of government who have been government ministers. Yeah. So th to say this, this whole apartheid thing is uh, an abuse, and in many ways, it's insulting to uh, um, the battle. They, they, they sort of. I, I say this, that the Palestinians in the past, they used to hijack and kidnap and, and uh, hijack planes and then kidnap people. Now they kidnap the theme. Apartheid is something that occurred in South Africa. Exactly. The battle against uh, apartheid was very important. And what they're doing is, is, is taking this away. And anybody who comes to Israel and sees what's going on with the Arabs here and saying, okay, it, it diminishes. Yeah. It diminishes the concept of the real concept of apartheid mm -hmm. by taking away from the black battle against white supremacy in South Africa. Because somebody coming here and saying, "Oh well, if this is the situation, what were the blacks in South Africa talking about?" It, yeah. It's it's nonsense. Well, this is unfortunately is what's happening when you have propaganda and people using this and and putting their own terms on this to try to 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 uh, make Israel or defame Israel in a way. It, it's 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 very sad. So. I would say anybody using that term, ignore it completely. Israel is in no way uh, an apartheid country. Uh, we have the blacks, in, the blacks, uh, the, uh, the Arab citizens of the state of Israel. We have Arab Supreme Court judges. We have police. Uh, uh, doctors. We have doctors. Uh, Miss Israel. I even forgot it, but you know, we never did anything about this because it is so, we don't even feel comfortable discussing it because uh. There's, there's equal citizens. Why should I make a point out of the fact that Arabs have rights? It's not something we wave about because it's something that's normal. Yeah. My, kid's, my kid's doctor, uh, the dentist, is uh, Fadi. My son loves going to Fadi, who's wonderful. And he's actually East Jerusalem. Wow. He's from East Jerusalem, and he opens up a practice in the Jewish areas of Jerusalem. Yeah. And he has a practice with other Arab doctors because they serve Jews and Arabs alike. My son goes there, and he's a wonderful dentist. Um, I go to the, the laundromat in my neighborhood in Jerusalem is, uh, is an Arab. Uh -huh. uh, the the uh, store that my son goes to and buys ice cream at is an Arab. So this is for us, especially in Jerusalem, it's very normal. In other places of Israel, uh, you can't even see the difference. They, you know, they're, they're Israelis in every way uh, in government press office. I had an employee who was an uh, Arab, Christian Arab from Lut. Wow. And she worked in the government press office, in the prime minister's office. Yeah. So it's absolutely ridiculous to, to even question the fact that the Arabs have all rights. Is there bigotry? Is it, listen, Israel is a normal country. You have 
good people, you have bad people, you have decent people, Jews, Arabs, everything. It's, yeah. Israel's a very normal country in that sense. So to make an issue out of it, uh, it's ridiculous. So here you have Arab parties that yeah. run for parliament, can be elected, you have out, um, Arabs running with the Jewish parties, so it's a, it's, it's a non-issue, except for people trying to defame the state of Israel. Am I right? Because I have seen, she's not there now, Suabi. Oh, Zawabi, she was with the, the Arab parties. There was right? an Arab lady, and who, she was calling Israeli soldiers for murderers and terrorists. It doesn't and matter. They're those Members of those parties today are still doing that. That's why I, They're still I mean, doing it. I, there were even an Arab member who is in jail now because yes. he was smuggling. Phones. Get this. There was an Arab MK in Israel working in the parliament, smuggling phones to terrorists inside an Israeli jail. But you had Azmi Pshara, who was a member of that party, and he was uh, spying for the Syrians and for Hezbollah, and Israel found out about it, and he left, he escaped Israel, and is now taking refuge in, in, in Lebanon. Yeah. And he was a member of parliament. And uh, unfortunately, they, they abused the power, many of them were doing this, and uh, you had Ahmed Tibi was an aide to Yasser Arafat. And today he's in the Israeli Knesset. and he was also a member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, which in my eyes is complete lunacy. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the courts in Israel, the Supreme Court allowed them to run as, as a separate party, despite all this action, despite the fact that the Israeli law says that you cannot run for parliament if you call for the destruction of the state of Israel and you don't recognize the state of Israel as being an independent state. And yet these parties run on that platform and the Supreme Court just last year confirmed that they can run which is uh, lunacy in my eyes. Only in Israel, that, that it's a little... It's, it's undermining the, the stability of this democracy. Yeah. By, and, and in, my, in I, my eyes, doing a disservice to the uh, loyal members, citizens of the state of Israel, Israeli Arabs who want to be part of this country, in many ways they share, and, and, and that's the true way of bringing Jews and Arabs together. Yeah. And by the way, Israel is the only country in the Middle East that Jews, Muslims, Christians can live safely and live together in the country yeah. and continue following their, their religious beliefs, it's only in Israel. Yeah. So Daniel, um, it's like uh, an unwritten law that if you have been the chief of the IDF, mm -hmm. you go into politics. <laughs> well, yeah. so, so I have people asking because all of a sudden there's now a gentleman named Benny Gantz right. who is like the main rival or opponent right. towards, and you were just explaining a little bit about how he had his party and then he right. united with uh, Lapid, and now they call their party blue and white. So the thing is, for the last two elections, it was so close. Right. It was so close with Likud, which is, let's just explain, Likud is the, is the party that the Prime Minister of Israel is the leader of, yes. which has been in power for many, for more than a decade. But now blue and white came, Benny Gantz and this group, and so the last two elections, it's been very, very close. So for people asking me, but what's going on? Because, you know, we love Bibi. And by the way, I want to tell you that I have many, 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 many followers and they love Netanyahu. Okay. They pray for him, you know, they are a supporter. Right and now, so. yeah, and now they're saying, who is this guy and why is it so close? So, so how would you explain it? Is Israel divided? Is it like 50-50? No. Because now we are in the third election and that's one thing. And then the other one was the president of Israel was really like, come on guys. Unity, unity, unity. We cannot have a third election. We need a unity. You got to give a little, you got to give a little. Uh, and then they were talking about a rotation all of a sudden. Right. You know, Bibi first like two years and then two, two years and Gans was saying no. Yeah. Bibi went down to all the way to saying, okay, I can sit four months. So what's up? Uh, is Israel divided like 50-50 because it's so close? There are very strong positions in Israel. I could say that about 30 years ago, we were divided very strongly on a right wing, left wing, when right wing was more for the settlements and for the settling of the land of Israel and the rights of the Jews to the to our ancient homeland. And the left wing was, though they accepted that because it was uh, the Labour Party created this, was among the, the leaders of the country when the nation was created. Yeah. And for many years today, Golda Meir and uh, Ben Gurion, their positions would be considered conservative and right wing. So, but the left wing back in, I would say the mid eighties, but especially with Oslo in 1993, they became the party for peace, believing that peace is the solution to all our problems here. Yeah. Unfortunately, the realities were not, you know, everybody believes if you just sit down together and you have peace with your enemies, everything will be wonderful. We'll all sit together and sing Kumbaya, my Lord. 
In reality, this is not happening. In realities, and we all know that, the and the Palestinians were very honest about it. Arafat from but the beginning... But there's no peace problem. Exactly. They said from the beginning that this is they're using this to give them an advantage to come back into the areas here and then use this it's, to... It's a slice for slice. Uh, yes. Their staged uh, plan of destroying the state of Israel, and Yasser Arafat was very strongly behind it. Yeah. And But even if we forget the ideology behind it, the, in, pra in practice what we had was two things happened. Uh, we had terrorist attacks conducted against Israel because there was no separation. Mm -hmm. The Arabs from Judea and Samaria could come into this, to the official state of Israel. They worked here, they found, and they used this. They took advantage of this, and then we had, you remember the period of time from, it started in 1994, immediately after Oslo, but it reached its pinnacle between 2000 and 2004. Uh, the Oslo War, the war, the, the, they called it the Intifada, which is a watered down term. They used the peace process in order to murder Israeli civilians. Exactly. And the second part was after the disengagement from Gaza, when we left the Gaza Strip. Now, people talk about Israeli occupation. There is no Israeli occupation of Gaza. There is not a single living or dead Jew because we removed the graves from the Gaza Strip as well. So there's not a single living, uh, living or dead Jew in the Gaza Strip, except for two people being held right now by Hamas, two yeah. Israeli citizens are being held by Hamas, except for them. These are people who have mental illnesses yeah, they and, they and they went into the Gaza Strip. One of them is Jewish, uh, an Ethiopian, another is an Israeli Arab. Yeah. Hamas holds them ransom for the Israeli government and they're holding the bodies of two Israeli soldiers or parts of bodies of Israeli soldiers. Yeah. With that exception, there is not a single Jew in the Gaza Strip. And yet they use this, instead of developing a wonderful uh, Arab-Palestinian country in the Gaza Strip, they used it to launch missiles, and Israel has been under missile attack from the Gaza Strip for the, for the better part of 18 years now. Mm -hmm. So you have these two situations, buses, restaurants, uh, stabbings, uh, cars running you over, this kind of terrorism, and missiles, it has a way of making people a little more reluctant to peace. Yeah. So you have a whole generation now in Israel. My son will be joining the army in a year, my nephew from Ashkelon who grew up in Ashkelon just said, so you have people who for 18 years are now joining or becoming adults and voting, finally voting. So you have a clear majority for the right wing in Israel. The problem then, why do we have this problem is there are a lot of people in Israel, a lot of politicians who do not like Netanyahu. Um, he has a way of uh, not, well, it's politics. And in the politics, people who want to be prime minister understand that as long as Netanyahu is prime minister, they'll never be able to get it. And they're doing everything to get him out of office. Um, the blue and white party, if you ask me what their ideology is, yes, they'll give you all sorts of explanations. But basically, they ran on a ticket, just not Bibi. If we're going to be honest here with your, yeah. with your viewers and listeners, it's, they, they have no real platform. Their only platform is they don't want Netanyahu. And uh, against that right now, there's uh, not a majority, but Netanyahu, because of this, because under any other circumstances, Lieberman would have joined a Likud-led yeah. government. Yeah. And you have a clear majority of 65 to 67 seats on the right wing together with the religious in Israel. So there would be no argument. But because of personal grudges, and I don't care, they'll give it you- It happens in any country. Yeah, but they'll give you all these explanations and you know, the president, and, and by the way, I'm happy there's no national unity government. There's no reason for national unity. Because I don't see the left wing calling for national unity when they got a clear majority under Rabin and formed the government back in 1993. There was no talk about national unity at that time. The only talk of national unity comes is when the right wing has a clear majority and left wing progressives do not want them. We see this happening in England. We see this happening in the United States, that once they lose the, the majority, they'll do everything to undermine the legitimacy. And the same thing is happening in Israel. I actually say that a lot of the things that happen in Western society, it first happens in Israel. So we've had, we've been going on with this struggle now mm -hmm. and with the left wing unacceptance of the democratic process. We've been going on with this now for over 30 some years. Wow. United States and Europe have, and, and England have just run into this recently. And I think that other European countries are going to have the same thing as countries move from this dream of the progressive universalism into national countries' yeah. rights yeah. and the identity of national rights and, and countries' rights as having a national identity. We have a clear national Jewish identity in the state of Israel. Some people are trying to undermine that and undermine the legitimacy of the right-wing government. And that's why right now we're at an impasse that will probably be resolved in the next election but the fact of the matter is so many people do not like Netanyahu personally, 
and do not like the politics. And we have other examples of why this is happening right now. But that's at the core of all the problems in Israel at the moment, the political problems. You know, he has been, uh, he has been the leader for many, many yes. years. He knows everything. So, well, not everything, but no, he knows a lot. He knows a lot. <laughs> yes. uh, so let's he has been a very successful prime minister, no doubt about absolutely. that. Absolutely. If I, to, to be honest with the people viewing, I am a supporter of Netanyahu. I will continue to be a supporter of Netanyahu. I believe he is the right person at the right time. And when he chooses, and we, the voters, if the Likud party decides to vote for somebody else, fine, that's legitimate. But as long as he is the, the elected official of the supporters of Likud, he's going to be our representative. And if he wins the election, wonderful. If not, then we lost. Then we on the right, on the, on the conservative side, know to accept the democracy and the, the, the benefits. And sometimes you lose in a democracy. There's yeah. nothing, you know, I remember losing when Shamir lost the election in 1993. I was very sad. I worked for the government, but I put my personal opinions aside and I served the government until a year later, well, two years later, when I felt I could no longer uh, represent the government, yeah. I quit. Yeah. Because if you can't do it, you, you're as a government you official, a bureaucrat, yeah. you have to leave the office. Yeah. So I did that at the time. But um, some people don't accept the, the, the democratic game. So let's just touch base a little bit because right now there are primaries right, in the Likud. In uh, next week. Yeah, so next week, so there are another guy in the party that Netanyahu is leading. His name is Gideon Saab. Yes, he, former minister of education, former minister of the interior. He was former uh, cabinet secretary. Very close he's to He's very well liked. That's my. That's um, my I don't see, but listen, personally, I know him. I worked when I worked with the prime minister's office, I worked with him very okay. closely on several projects. Tell? He's a very nice guy, very, very intelligent. Yes. Um, he doesn't have the oratory skills of Netanyahu, but he certainly is ideologically sound, etc. Um, of course, he's popular because he, he's, he worked, he's a very good politician. He worked very diligently within Likud to set up a power base, and he's done that. Um, Netanyahu is also at the, whatever happens, Netanyahu is at the twilight of his career, that's yeah. quite clear. Yeah. He's 70 years old, he's been prime minister now for 10 years straight, altogether for over 13 years. He may be for another uh, long period of time, it's very interesting. He will be the interim prime minister longer, when he, if he has to step down, but the next time the former government, he will have been interim prime minister longer than Ehud Barak was prime minister legally for. Really so that's know. how long he's been, uh, how long this process has been yeah. going on right yeah. now. So yes, he's putting up a challenge to be the, and taking a very big uh, chance right now because he is also creating animosity on those people who support Netanyahu. But um, I can say that he will be, if he is duly elected within Likud, I will be very surprised if he is because I think Netanyahu has strong support yeah. within the Likud party. But with politics, you never but, know. But this is democracy. That's, you know, Absolutely. that's why maybe, yes, let's have the primaries. Let's yes. vote for who you. I was actually very happy when he agreed to do this yes. because it was talked that he wouldn't do it. But the only problem I have is that there are other very qualified people that can inherit Netanyahu within Likud. Yeah. I can, the former mayor of Jerusalem, Nir Barkat. Nir Barkat. Yeah, he used to be a commander of mine in the paratroopers. Ah. Uh, so was Benny Gantz, by the way. Oh. <laughs> he was also a former paratrooper. Yeah, yeah, so that's the right. paratrooper, Mike Oren and I served in the same company together. Nir Barkat was a commander. You can tell some Mike stories. and I were, were buddies in the same unit. So um, the paratroopers have a lot of control here in Israel. I'm going to have you back for sure, I'm telling you. <laughs> so Nir Barkat is one. Yuli Edelstein is another. Um, Chaim Katz, who, who did a, a, a huge revolution on the roads in Israel, yeah. and he was Minister of Transportation, did a, and, and the airlines. He did a wonderful job as a, as a, as a government minister. Yeah. So you have a lot of very qualified, but they're not standing up against Netanyahu at this time. Avi Difter, who was former head of, of Shin Bet. Yes, yes. Any one of these could be a very good candidate as leader of Likud, but they're not running right now because they respect the fact that Netanyahu Net is the leader. Still here. Uh, Saar took a chance. Um, I just hope that they don't decide that if Netanyahu loses, then he has to be the replacement. No, you have to have elections. After Netanyahu, yeah. he may win. That's fine. Yeah. I, I may actually support him. I don't know at this moment because I support Netanyahu. Yeah. So let's just talk for a minute. How does it work? You know, with me, it can't be a minute. <laughs> no, but it's, I love it. So let's just talk about how does it work when we are not really having a government? Can you make a budget? What about all the budgets? What about all the things that needs to be done in Israel? How does this work when we are, because this is unheard of. Well, actually, we haven't had a government for a year now. That's what I mean. And listen, the sky hasn't fallen down. We are sitting in beautiful every, Jerusalem. Uh, everything, actually, things are better now. Actually, the indications, the year-end indications 
um, or the OECD have shown that Israel has actually improved in the past year without a functioning government. Um, but can they make decisions? Can they make a budget? They can, can they... make sort of, no, they can't make a budget. No. The budget has to be voted on by and, and accepted in the parliament. Yes. And now since the parliament is dispersed, they can't. So what they do is they have this um, situation where the Ministry of Interior, uh, the Ministry of Finance has a one, they take the last budget that yeah. was confirmed yeah. and they take a one, uh, one twelfth of that for each month. Okay. Meaning the budget is only given for, uh, if, let's say, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had uh, $100 million, yes. or to make it easy on the calculations, had $120 million as their budget, which is not anywhere near their budget, but let's say they had that, yeah. they would get this month, they would get, 100, uh, they would get $12 million okay. this month to use. Yes. And then next month, the same thing. So they can't plan for long terms, they can't do anything long term, but they can, for, they can um, pay for things that have been done or projects that ongoing projects they can continue funding yeah. and this is the same you know you have hospitals and roads and that's and, what i'm thinking yeah so everything has one twelfth of the budget allocated no new projects no new nothing they can if there's something exceptional suddenly you need for yeah. for example the ministry of health every year they sit and decide on um, what kind of uh, sub how to subsidize certain um, um for, for for people who are ill certain medicines are subsidized by yeah. government yeah. So they have to sit and they have to decide and the government will subsidize this on a special um, decision. Okay. But besides those guys, and certainly the uh, defense budget for the military, for the Mossad, for the I'm Shibet, listening, I'm just reading people's okay. questions. Uh, those things are continued uh, to be funded separately because the country has to defend itself. Okay. So other than that, everything continues and, and functions, but it's not, it's not the very best way. Okay. So there was a lady asking, yes. very simple, what's the difference between the function of a president and the prime minister of Israel. Israel? The president is basically ceremonial. He is elected by the Knesset, by the politicians in Israel. Um, he's, uh, How is, long is he serving? Uh, for seven years. It's seven years, one term, seven years, um, because there used to be... There, I'll, 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 I'll say, yeah, it's I'll say no, but in the past, like, it was four years and you could, they could renew it. So they suddenly decided that it wasn't, it wasn't honorable for the president to start going and, and making sure that the other politicians would vote for him. Uh, so this way he's free for, of any of the politicking okay, and can be a, a ceremonial and, a, and a, 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 it's like the queen in England. He decides on, he can, again, he can, he has no formal decision making. If 61 members of Knesset said, this person has to, is the person we want, we believe can form a government, he has to do it. He has no okay. say in this. But he's in ceremonies, in uh, government, uh, in, in national events, he's president. He traveled abroad, representing he tra yes, Israel. Yes, yes. So yeah. that's, the pr that's the president. It's basically ceremonial. The, pre the prime minister is the person elected by the public, and that is the person who uh, represents Israel officially and makes, the, makes policy decisions, yeah. is the government of Israel. Yeah. So the last thing we're going to touch is, you know, what's coming now, uh, because this is what's in the media. This is what everybody is talking about, indictment, indictment, indictment. Mm -hmm. So the prime minister has been the longest serving prime minister in the history of Israel. And uh, like you just touched a little bit, there are always people who like him, there are people who don't like him. Right. For the last several years, there has been some investigation. It's called case, I think, 1000, 2000. Yes. Three or four. Right. Three, yeah. had, three, by the way, had nothing to do with him. But that's right. true. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, but it was done for. Um, yeah. Finish your question. And yeah, I'll explain. yeah, yeah. So uh, a lot of you have been asking me, saying, "What is going on? What is going on to us, Phoebe?" And and you know, uh, Mandeville came out and said, "We have investigated." The attorney general. The attorney general in Israel yeah. came out of a press conference saying, "We've been doing all of this investigation. We have decided to indict the prime minister in three different cases." Right. And uh, it was shocking for a lot of my followers saying, what in the world is going on? So the reason why I'm asking all of this, because when I asked people saying you were coming, someone, there was a question saying, with all of this going on, can you vote for Bibi? Mm -hmm. Can he stay? What, 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 how is all of this working? And uh, I know, so this is just what I'm gonna say and then you take over, because I know when something like this happened, you can apply for immunity. You can apply for immunity as uh, and a this member is, of Knesset. Yes. Any member of Knesset can and, apply for and, immunity. And there, there has been others who has been, right. you know. So Bibi has 30 days to decide if he's going to do that or not. 
If he decided, oh, it doesn't matter right now because you don't have a Knesset. That was what I was going to say. Right, so because we don't, the committee who should approve that, right? The Knesset they don't, committee, they, they don't, don't exist. They don't exist anymore. <laughs> so, so it's very complex just time. to charge all of this. That's why basically you're here because I can't explain all of this. <laughs> I hope I can. <laughs> we are not going to go into you know this and this and this and this case and this case. Right. It's about breach of trust. It's about what was it? Corruption. It's about uh, it's bribery. A, right. It's about receiving a pink champagne for his wife. It's a lot of balagan, as we say here in Israel. But the fact of the matter is the Prime Minister has been indicted. Right. But it's a long process. Yeah, it can over. take years yeah, before anything. I mean, they have a list of 333 witnesses who... So... In, in, including his own lawyer, by the way. Yeah, it's so... Which makes so it can impossible you... for his lawyer to defend it. Just so people understand. So, yeah, so can you just, what yeah, is this um, about? Look, I'll do two things here. First, you very well explained the, I would say, the official version of things. You have an investigation. We're a democratic country. We're a country of law. There were questions raised. And then the police uh, began an investigation with, together with the Attorney General's Office of the State of Israel. They took hundreds of millions of shekels of an investigation. He was questioned over and over again. They gave these names, these uh, um, investigations, uh, 1,000, 2,000, he said 3,000 was into the fact of bribery for submarines, yeah. which eventually there were indictments, and Netanyahu was not even mentioned, even in the indictments of other people, but it was still given the name uh, file number 3,000 by the Israel uh, police. Yeah. Um, finally, he was indicted on three, uh, as you said, bribery, a breach of, of uh, trust, uh, and other things. Yeah. That's the official version of it. That's, but then why are so many people unhappy about what happened here? I can basically say, I think Americans will understand this right now when you go into the articles of impeachment being brought against uh, the president of the United States. Basically, anybody who understands law knows that any person, if you want to look for something against them with the law, you can accuse, you can accuse, and you can file indictments against anybody anything that you want to. And this is what a lot of people are feeling is happening here in Israel. And why is that? Because of the way and, uh, and the selective uh, indictments against the prime minister. Things that, have not, that other uh, politicians have been suspect of in the past have not been brought to indictments against. By the way, against Benny Gantz, there are questions that, that have not even been investigated. The attorney general's office refused to investigate questions about Benny Gantz and the uh, bribery or questions of bribery that he received from a company he worked with after he had left the, the, the chief of staff. And then there are other politicians in Israel in the past, people who were candidates for either attorney general or especially minister of justice in Israel, suddenly indictments were brought up against them, questions, and after years, between four to seven years, they were eventually not found not guilty the charges were thrown out by the Supreme Court in Israel, saying they shouldn't have even been charged. And this is after they were in lower courts, eventually reached the Supreme Court. So these people were found not only not guilty, but clear of all accusations. So people are asking once again, is the same thing happening here? Why? Because in Netanyahu's case, him receiving gifts from friends, cigars, etc. Listen, we all know, and, and you said that these people here are, are supporters of Netanyahu. It's quite clear to all of us that if Netanyahu decided to just be on the speaker's trail and just be a speaker, he could get, if, if Hillary Clinton and, and Clinton can get $600,000 per speech, Netanyahu could probably charge a million and there'll be people who will be willing to pay, pay him for, for that. He could have been a multimillionaire as just being on the board of advisors of all sorts of companies, not only because of his name, but because of his abilities. He yeah. is very smart and very capable. Yes. He could have been a multimillionaire if he hadn't been prime minister. So he doesn't need bribery or the, being the prime minister or getting cigars and champagne, this is absolutely ridiculous. This is what you're charging a prime minister for. So that's one. Second, and this is the most ridiculous uh, accusation that has not occurred in any place in the world, and even Dershowitz in the United States. People are saying thank you for being so informative. <laughs> I'm glad. And saying it's like, it's like Trump. <laughs> well, Trump, uh, God bless Trump. But that's another issue. We'll talk about him on another day. God but just to finalize, even Dershowitz in the United States, a, a, a renowned world expert, on the, is saying that the, the accusations being brought up against Netanyahu are absolutely ridiculous and constitute an attempt of a coup d'etat, a legal coup d'etat against the prime minister. I happen to agree with that, by the way, and you're giving some inside information 
to the people here. I am now joining uh, the leading uh, civil, civilian organization in Israel, Atnuale Mishilut, the Organization for Governance and Democracy, which are fighting the legal coup d'etat and the legal bureaucrats, the bureaucrats attempting to make decisions and take away the power of the people. We vote for elected officials. It cannot be some government official, whether legal or anything else, for them, the police, etc., for them to try to undermine the decision, the elected official of the people and the decision of the people of the state of Israel, totally unacceptable for them. And this is what many of us feel is happening because with the, the ridiculous four, case 4000 being brought up about the prime minister is this, that he received good press in return for giving some kind of benefit, which has not been proven. And if, and by the way, in, 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 in bribery cases, you're supposed to charge both the giver and the receiver. Yeah. And those supposedly from the Israeli media, from Wala, uh, an obscure website in Israel, who have no evidence. And on the contrary, 90% of their articles were critical of Netanyahu. Yeah. They claimed that he had received, and listen, I worked for Israel government, you know, with the government press office, I worked with relationship, every government spokesman for every government office, every person with dealing with Israeli Hasbara, working with media under these circumstances should also be brought up on charges because what did we do? If you give an exclusive to the New York Times, you're expecting to get something in return. So I'm not saying that this is what happened in Netanyahu's case, but if he's being brought up on charges like that, every relationship between government officials and politicians and media should be, should be subject to the same kind of thing. So Netanyahu is being charged. And this is how absurd. I'm sure there are people sitting there, oh, this can't be true. This can't be it. Yes, it is. That's how ridiculous it is. And that's why, and by the way, Israel does not have a constitution, but we have basic laws. And these basic laws have said very clearly that a prime minister does not have to step down when he's charged. He can only, he only can be removed after the court after a final decision by the Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, only when they give down their final decision. If he is found guilty, only then does he not have, does he have, he has to step down at that point. Yeah. Now there's a whole campaign saying, no, if he's charges, he can't even run. And here is where our concern is being challenged at this moment, is that the Attorney General is raising questions if Netanyahu can even run for premiership, and there's no, nothing in the law stipulates that right now and they're creating new laws in the midst of a process creating new laws against the prime minister of israel that's why many qu people question the validity the sincerity and the legality of this whole process it's it's very dangerous that's that a lot today. of information my head is yes. and this is happening with people who do not the media are who should have been the first people like, opposed to this by the way the things that are being brought against obama in the united states right now the, the questions being being raised about his behavior as president, these things are worse than what Nixon did. Huh. Nixon. No, I'm going. No, no. I'm, oh. I said Obama. Yeah, you did. The questions about Obama and what he did to Trump, his spying on Trump, You're is right. far worse than what happened in Watergate. Yeah. And yet, the president of the United States at that time was uh, brought up and, and had to and had to Nixon had to leave. Yeah. So Obama did. So they're very selective, and you have nobody in the American media right now doing what Bernstein, Woodward and Bernstein did, those of your viewers right now who remember the Watergate case, Bernstein, Woodward and Bernstein from the Washington Post, you have no journalists right now looking into what did Obama as president do against the candidate running from the opposing party. No, right. And why? Because they're letting their political uh, um, biases get involved in their professional job as journalists. That's why many people don't, and the same thing is happening here in Israel. The journalists, instead of doing their job for the people, now I'm joining a, a, a movement of the public, a public movement of, of individuals who are trying to do the job that the journalists should be doing. Wow. So let's end this by, by just summing up. What's going to change? What's it going to take that there will be, you know, we're having the election, so that's it. So it's gonna, probably going to be ugly from now until March 2nd Somebody's is the there. election. So what's going to change? I mean, what, uh, we, will have a, we will have a new government? We, we will, there will. I don't, government, what kind of government? I don't know. There won't be a fourth election. That I can tell you absolutely. Okay. So many things can happen between now. Oh, gosh. And Especially March, in this country. In this country. Things that did not happen before. Now, Netanyahu was accused of a lot of things. He'll use his position as prime minister to start a war with Hezbollah, to start a war with Gaza, yeah. to do this or do that. None of this happened. 
all these accusations thrown at him over the past uh, year. It, it happened before. But in the past year, we have enough time now to remember. Was there a war with Hezbollah? And we had, they, they attempted to, they assaulted Israel. We didn't take that. We didn't take advantage of that to go to war. Same thing with Gaza. Actually, Netanyahu is paying a price for not going to war in Gaza against yeah. Hamas because, and a lot of people are not pleased with him. And interesting, the same left-wingers who warn us that Netanyahu is not going to go, is going to go to war. When he doesn't, oh, why aren't you going to war? You're failing at your job. So he can't win. Yeah. Uh, regardless of what he does, there'll be those who will criticize him. So a lot of things can happen. The real danger right now for the state of Israel and the real situation in the entire Middle East right now is the threat posed to Israel from Iran. There is a serious threat there, not only for Israel, for Saudi Arabia, for Iraq, for other countries here, and by the way, for Europe as well, because they're developing in, this, in, in complete yeah. violation of the agreement, intercontinental ballistic missiles. They have missiles now that can reach Europe itself. So they intend to pose a threat not only to Israel, so, but they do want to. Their first goal, and they, we have enough intelligence and understanding to understand that they're planning an attack against Israel. Right now, we've been able to thwart their efforts, yeah. but who knows, that can happen between now and, and March. But I can tell you about the Prime Minister person I know, and I sat with him in, in June this, of this year uh, in a private meeting, he and I, and, um, I, and I said to him, I don't know how you stand it. He's 70 years old. Yeah, I, I... And how can you, and he, is, uh, you know. How much does he sleep at night, one hour? He doesn't sleep a lot. No, I don't know. I, I, I don't get a good night's sleep, and I'm, and he was functioning. He's, and I asked him, how do you manage with yeah. it? How do you, so, and, and he was just, he didn't even see, he didn't even feel sorry for himself. No, no. He sort of brushed outside my feeling sorry for him. And I was just looking at him. Here's a man who's 70 years old. And think about your parents, your grandparents, 70 years old. Uh, he still has that spark. Yeah. And he has that. And I saw him this week in uh, an event for Likud. I, didn't, I wasn't there, but I saw the videos. Standing on a chair, speaking to the people. He's really into this. Yeah, is. There is no politician in Israel who has that kind of spunk and has that uh, commitment. And he said, that's not, he's worried, his concentration now is on, his, is on what is the best for the state of Israel. Yeah. So he puts aside, he says, the only thing that bothers me is when they go after my, my son and after my wife, yeah. that bothers him. But everything else, he keeps focused on the state of Israel. And we should, we should be grateful for having that. But yeah. unfortunately, the Jewish people have a history of, of not, uh, not appreciating their leaders as far back as Moshe, not uh, as Moses, not appreciating our leaders and only afterwards realizing how fortunate we were have to, to have these kind of leaders. Yeah. I was thinking last night that, like we spoke about now, Netanyahu, you know, there's primaries in the Likud, so he's facing Gideon, so that's yeah. one thing. Then we have the election, right. you know, is he going to be elected or not? And then we have all the other things going around Israel, you know, with Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, right. everything. And, and I was like, Bibi, I mean, how can you even have all of this in your head? He succeeds, and I want to say one thing to his credit is, and especially if any of your viewers are Jewish, we're living in the golden era of the Jewish people. Yeah. We have never been as strong, as affluent, yeah. as successful as we are at this time, not even the times of, of the biblical times of Solomon. We are at the peak of our abilities in the past few years, and we should appreciate this. And a lot of this has to do with the support that we're getting from people around the world who understand Israel's place yeah. and Israel's contribution to humankind. Uh, we have to express the gratitude of the Israeli people to the President of the United States and his support Absolutely. for the state of Israel and for the Jewish people, despite he's also being smeared very often. Uh, there are people in Europe and uh, now in England themselves. And, and the, I, I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Boris Johnson when he was uh, a, a journalist in Britain okay. and he came to Israel before running as mayor uh, of London. And I sat and I met an intelligent person who I could tell knew a lot because I didn't know this at the time. I found yeah. out later he had been to Israel and lived in Israel. Okay. He knew a lot, but he asked wonderful questions. He didn't act like many journalists do as if he knew everything. So I think England also has a wonderful prime minister right now. Yes, and know. hopefully we'll do the right thing here in Israel and vote for a very successful prime minister that we have. One thing we can agree on, we are living in interesting yeah, absolutely, times, absolutely. especially also because, you know, uh, this is the one nation that the whole world would want to tell what to do. You know, the leaders are flying. I remember with horror, Carrie and everybody, you know, when they were flying in, telling Bibi what to do, not to do. I mean, so one thing is that, and I keep telling Israel, you just do what's right for you. 
We're doing be that. strong. We're doing that. I tell you, I'll finish on this thing. I have four kids. I wouldn't bring them up in any other country in the world. Exactly. I love the United States. I grew up there. I have family there. But Israel is a wonderful country, especially for children. But democracy is nice, and being a Jewish state is nice, and everything is fantastic. But for me, this country means one thing and one thing only. You, those of us here remember that iconic image from the Warsaw Ghetto of the yeah. Jewish child with his yes. hands up the... Nobody knows who that child is, but he is iconic. That doesn't happen anymore. We are no longer helpless victims. Our children will never be defenseless again. Nobody, nobody will make decisions for the Jewish people inside the land of Israel and the state of Israel. We're here. And they may not be pleased about it, but to be honest, we don't care anymore. This is our country. We're here to stay as long as we can. And in God's support, this will be for eternity. I could not, <laughs> I could not have closed this. Pro I see the hearts coming up here. They like what you're Thank saying. You. So I could not close this in a, in a better way. Daniel Seaman. Just, so, just so people know, if Israel, the success of Israel is the success of nations around the world, of humankind. And where Israel goes, so does the world. And you're right. I keep saying Israel is the front door to the whole world. And we're happy to give contributions and help humankind and do everything. And look, at, and under the circumstances still, what we're doing and the contributions we have from yeah. this country right now, yeah. despite if we were just left alone to do and, and succeed and thrive, can you imagine what a, what a gift we would be able to, to give to humanity? Yeah, right. Daniel Seaman, thank you so much for taking thank time. You. Thank you very you much. Know, thank all of you. I mean, you, um, I'm definitely having your back, <laughs> if that's okay. Uh, I think there are many, many things to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, never a dull moment here. <laughs> never, ever a dull moment. Thank you, everybody, for watching this. Thank you for supporting Israel. It's much appreciated. And I want to say, would you share out this video? Because you said a lot of important things. Oh, so. A lot of important things you. that your people, your family, your ch country, everybody needs to know. Daniel Zeman, Jerusalem Jane, signing off for the internal capital, the undivided capital Absolutely. of the most magnificent country that I've been blessed to call my home for several years now. Glad you're here with us. Thank you. Bye-bye.